Right. Good afternoon. Thanks everybody for, for taking the time to, to join today. Uh, we have uh, a repeat uh, speaker. Uh, I think we've had a couple of uh, Globus talks in the past, uh, but today we're going to be talking about a uh, pretty exciting development from their world. Uh, they're the release and, and sort of uh, new, new profile of uh, version five of uh, their software stack. And uh, Rashna is going to be presenting that today. So I will turn it over to you. Right, thanks, Jason. Let me share my screen here. Everyone, Jason, you're able to see it okay? Looks good. Okay, great. Thanks everyone for joining us. Um, in the next hour, I'm going to do a overview of the version five architecture, speak about some of the new features, just highlight some of the new features. And then I'll spend some time contrasting uh, version four to version five. Um, I see a lot of people uh, who have joined who probably are already running version four. So I'll, I'll highlight some of the differences and, and changes you should expect. And I'll uh, close out with just giving an overview of the installation and what it looks like to run the version five server. I should have a time in the end for questions, but happy to take questions as we go as well. So you have probably seen this slide um, before. We have been working on V5 for a little bit here um, and the pivot and the architecture provides us a way to provide new features for both users and administrators and sets it up as a nice platform for additional capabilities. We're looking at you know, metadata extraction, being able to build platform capabilities for managing uh, the endpoint itself and such, right? So I'll do a quick overview of the architecture. It looks a little uh, different from V4. So we are all on the same page with some of the terminology, uh, the new pieces that we're using that'll get used through the rest of the presentation. So the first one, I mean, we are of course building on data transfer nodes. These are standard data transfer nodes that we have come to learn and love from um, all the spec and information that we get from the ESNet folks. Hopefully this is installed in a science DMZ. It's well connected uh, to networks and able to move data in and out, right? Then there's the Globus Connect server stack itself. Uh, V5 is a completely separate uh, uh, stack and version. So that gets installed in each of the data transfer nodes. And the endpoint remains the logical uh, construct that ties together these different DTNs and can be used for um, moving, the, moving the data and also the construct that helps us provide the network configuration. So things like concurrency, parallelism and all of that gets configured at the endpoint. So this forms the basic layer. And then the connectors are the pieces that then tie the DTN to the storage system. By default, we have the POSIX connector that gets shipped with the uh, Globus Connect server. And that's the piece that, that speaks to the storage system. And then with V5, we have two a uh, couple of new constructs, one of which is called a storage gateway. This is a logical construct that essentially allows you to configure policies against a particular uh, storage instance. So in this case, you can see the storage gateway is configured to be of type POSIX. And then it also has some policies about what identities from which domain is required, what's the timeout, how often does somebody have to authenticate to access data on that storage gateway. And it also has policies about the security pieces, whether it's touching protected data, high assurance data and such, right? So storage gateway that sits on top of the endpoint provides that abstraction where you can make the connection to the specific storage instance and the policies that, are, that govern how data is accessed on it. The same DTN pool can also support multiple connectors. So you would just add connectors of different types uh, to the data transfer nodes and then create a storage gateway with policies that's specific to that, right? So in this example, we are looking at an AWS S3 connector. So you're probably aware Globus supports a whole bunch of um, storage systems, including object stores. So all of the um, Google object stores, Google Drive, also Google Cloud Storage. So the, in every case, there is a unique connector for that. And that's what you would install. And then you would configure a storage gateway to access data via that. 
And then the last piece is the data access interface. So those are part of what we call collections. These are built on, uh, created on top of the storage gateway. And the collection is what provides the grid FTP and the HTTPS access to the data itself. So the collections inherit their policies from the storage gateway. So you can see in the first example, the collections that are sitting on the storage gateway that has high assurance is automatically high assurance and so on. There are two types of collections. One is called a mapped collection where data access is provided for users who have local accounts. So users on, at the institution or users who have local account at the cluster, they can log in with um, to Globus and then they get mapped to their local account and then they access data via that. Guest collections support the sharing functionality. So such users who have access using a map collection can choose to share a subset of their folders with other users, uh, with their collaborators. And that, for that, we would use guest collections. Right? So if you think about it from sort of where version four was, we have, we have added a bunch of new features and I'll highlight, I'll highlight those, but architecturally, we have further abstracted out uh, the network and server management in the endpoint, the storage and the storage policy management and storage gateways, and then the data access interfaces on collections. Right? Your users will always come in, search for collections or find the collections that they, they need and use that for accessing data. As an administrator, you'll end up dealing with endpoints and storage gateways. So you'll configure those and then users will always use the collections to access, right? So what are some of the new features? Um, I'll highlight a few. So first from an end user and a developer perspective, right? So the, the big one is the HTTPS access. Essentially with V5, when you have a collection, users can either do bulk data transfers using grid FTP, or they can come in and use HTTPS to directly access the data. Now the HTTPS access is not meant to replace the bulk data access, it's meant to augment the use cases. For example, if you're doing something like this portal snapshot that I have here, and you wanna do like a thumbnail view of an image, you wanna do a quick download in browser download of the data, or write something where there's programmatic access to the data. You want to do a get on that data to pull it in. So all of those are made possible with the HTTPS interface, right? Um, one of the big value propositions here is that the access, whether it is through grid FTP or through HTTPS, enforces the same security policy. So the users will be required to meet the authentication pieces, the same authorization and everything. So you will configure the security policy once and it opens up both the bulk data transfer and the, and the uh, web access to this. Then the second piece that we have put in some effort and the V5 architecture supports is better credential management for cloud storage systems. If you are using Globus today for accessing AWS S3 or Google Drive, then you will notice that the user's credential has to be locally provisioned on the DTN. Um, typically it's an admin action or the user ends up getting access to SSH and drop their credentials, right? With V5 architecture, it allowed us to do a clean separation there and the user can come in through the UI and provide their credentials as needed. So in this example, you're looking at an S3, uh, S3 key that is needed. So there's no reason for locally provisioning it. Although we are providing this UI and a user guided management, the credentials still stay on the endpoint. So the credentials are not cloud hosted and only the institution that is providing this, um, providing this connector and, and the ability to access data, only, only that institution can see the uh, user's credential, right? And then the third one worth highlighting here that also has user um, in, interface implications is OAuth-based security. So, I mean, clearly the primary motivation when we started this was how do we cleanly support HTTPS access, right? How do we ensure authentication and, and access there? And OAuth was the way to go there. So we ended up 
uh, you getting that all right, making sure there is a way for the user to access uh, data using HTTP as they get redirected for authentication as needed, concerns are in place. We then extended that out so that all of the data access uses OAuth based security, and there is no need to get user certificates behind the scenes. Right? So the two snapshots that you see here, the one on the left is how the user sees a message that says they have to authenticate. Um, this looks very familiar. This is how it would have seen, it would have looked with uh, V4. But then on redirection, it's very much an OAuth consent-based model. So the user is told that this application wants access or the transfer service is gonna transfer on their behalf and then they consent to it, right? So now we have this same security layer across both bulk access and, and HTTPS. The, the feature that I just described required some work on consent management. Um, so this is a little bit for anyone who has looked at OAuth and, and consents and the, and the whole piece that comes with it. In that case, we, we generally support an idea that when a user accesses an application like the Globus web application, they would consent for a known set of capabilities, right? I allow this web application to access uh, the Globus transfer service on my behalf, the group service on my behalf. But because each of the collection itself is using OAuth for security, we updated all of that to support incrementally adding capabilities to your consent. So now when you come into the Globus uh, web app, or if, if you use our CLI or build your own portal, then as new collections are being accessed, as the user touches new data, then the consent will be requested just for that that uh, new collection and add it to the consent basket that is there for the user. So very um, sort of, what does it look like in terms of a user interface? Previously, the only thing you would do is you would be able to just remove consent for everything for a given application, right? You would just say the Globus web app cannot access anything on my behalf. But now with the new model, you have more fine grained capabilities that you can revoke consent for. So for example, if you have a long running transfer between a couple of uh, leadership class facilities and then it is done and you don't wanna leave any consent in, in an application, you can just remove consent for that and collections to be not accessible from that application. Right? So it's very fine grained. So we, have, we did a whole bunch of work to enhance the security layers. This is not only useful for GCS5, but it's broadly available as a part of our auth platform. So if you are building a data portal or a science gateway or an application that leverages Globus Auth, then these capabilities can be used by you as well on, on those custom applications. So that's from a user perspective. From an administrator perspective, um, one of the key things you probably saw the very first architecture slide that I showed is the ability to support multiple connectors or storage um, instances. Again, from the same DTN pool. So again, if you're using V4, if you wanted to do, um, if you wanted to support another storage type, if you got a new, new on-prem object store, or you wanted to start allowing your users to use Globus against their uh, G Suite uh, Google Drive, then it required an additional server to be provisioned and, and connectors was the one, only one storage type was supported. In this case, we uh, expanded that model so you could have a DTN pool that is well provisioned and configured that's sitting in the right place and then just add new connector types to it. And you can have multiple types of storage and multiple instances of it all being served through the same set of servers, right? And then the second big change with V5 is the work we have done for state management across the data transfer nodes. So first, there is no need for a shared file system between the data transfer nodes. You can have it, but it's not a requirement anymore with V5. And then there is a fully managed uh, backup and sync service that ensures the state across all the nodes in the DTN is, is kept in sync, right? Uh, we use a Amazon service called AppSync to actually accomplish this. And all of the state is encrypted with an admin generated key when it's put on the cloud backup. So, the, so the, when the administrator sets up GCS, 
they generate an encryption key, and that key is used for encrypting every piece of state, which is then pushed to the cloud backup and then used to synchron uh, synchronize across all the DTNs. So you can imagine, in addition to sort of a recovery, so if something, if it go, things go down, it's a matter of bringing your DTN back up. And as long as you have the endpoint credentials, you can be back up and running where you left off. You can also see how this makes it very simple to add a new node into this pool or remove a node and so on, right? So this eliminates the single file configuration. It eliminates any state that was stored in a shared file system and moves everything to be something that's just automatically managed by Globus for backup and recovery. And then a third one I want to highlight on the administrator side is um, there is a configuration management API now. There's a GCS manager service that runs on each of the nodes. And that allows management of endpoints, storage gateways, and collections, right? So the you don't have to be on the DTN. You don't have to SSH on the DTN and run local tools. You can completely manage it using the API. And again, the configuration changes are propagated. So this not only helps with management and building out interfaces, but it also allows integration. So if you have other configuration management systems or frameworks that you use, you can integrate in uh, deployment and management of your uh, Globus endpoint using this, this configuration management API. Roshna, there's a question that came in that would probably be relevant for us to answer right now. Uh, you mentioned AWS, S3, and Google. Is the same capability and functionality the same for Azure? Very good question. Uh, we don't have Azure Blob Storage right now. It is on our roadmap uh, to, to add, but that is not a connector that is supported in Globus today. We have S3 and then the, the Google ones, Ceph, and a bunch of other object stores, but, but we still haven't, don't have the Azure one. The next one in the pipeline is actually Microsoft OneDrive because there was more demand for that than, than Azure. But when we do Azure Blob, I expect it will look very much the same. It will be a connector you would drop in and then it would work. Okay, and then there was a follow-up. What is what is the timeline for Azure? Um, I actually, I don't think we have a definite timeline. I can tell you at, at most, the earliest we would get to it is probably Q2 of next year. We have we are working on iRods right now with the iRods team that'll come out next, and then we are working on OneDrive, and after that is I think uh, a toss up between a couple of things. One is the Azure uh, Blob Storage, and then there's been a few other requests for Dropbox and a few other things. So if you're interested and this is something that your institution would like to use, do drop us a note. We gather input and use that as a way to prioritize which ones we would we would uh, work on. So the earliest it would be sometime Q2 next year. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jason. Okay, so um, the next few slides, maybe some of you are new to Globus, in which case these slides may not be that useful, although part of it is useful where I talk about V5 functionality, but a large majority of the community is going to be transitioning from V4 to V5. So I want to spend some time contrasting what some of the features look like, right? So the first one I'll talk about is credentials for the endpoint itself, right? How do you, how, how is that established? With version four, Globus ID, uh, which is an identity provider that Globus runs. This is completely distinct from Globus auth. Just an, uh, you, you can establish a username, password, and it's an IDP you run. That was required uh, to create an endpoint. With V5, we have eliminated any, any such requirement. Any identity that can be used to log into Globus, and I think we have about over 800 IDPs with which you can log into Globus. So you could use your institutional identities, what it comes down to. You would use that uh, to, uh, as credential for the endpoint. But more importantly, you would register that endpoint with Globus Auth as a resource server. And this is using OAuth again here. And the endpoint itself gets its own client ID and secret and thus its own identity, right? So there's no more any, uh, there's no requirement to password share your Globus ID that you used to do. You end up having a full-fledged system where there's a registered 
resource server with a client ID secret. You can add other people as admins on it. So they also have access to it and can rotate the secret and such. Right? So we are adopting OAuth for that as well. Then the next one is server credentials itself. So for the servers that are running. So with V4, by default, Globus issued these using a Globus CA. And you know, because it was the client was the Globus transfer service, it all worked just fine. And we also supported custom certificates. So if your institution was able to go get certificates from other CAs, you could drop them in. I think we had the full IGTF uh, trusted uh, certificates in our trusted CAs in our in our trust trust chain. With V5, we had to move to a solution that also would work for browser-based downloads. So we chose Let's Encrypt as the certificate provider. So by default, Globus will get certificates from Let's Encrypt for the servers that you set up and manage all of that, getting the certificates, any renewal that is needed, all of that is completely managed by Globus. We do realize that there will be deployments that need custom certificates that you will deploy your own and that is planned and that should be something that will be in the next release. Um, so you can add your own certificates to the mix. Then let's talk about management interface, right? How do you manage these endpoints? With V4, it was all on the DTN. So largely you, you logged into the DTN, you made changes to the configuration file that was there, and then you reran Globus Connect Server setup. And you had to do this on each DTN. So if you had a multi-DTN setup, you would, you would go do this on each of those DTNs, ensure they're all in sync, and, and that's how the configuration change took effect, right? With GCS5, like I mentioned, we have a, G a manager service, a GCS manager service uh, that's running on these DTNs. So here's one example, right? They're all running in the data.globus.org um, domain name. And I'll talk about this a little bit uh, later in the presentation, but this is the default uh, DNS we, we provide. And then there is a unique number in front of it. So then you can just use the CLI and update the configuration and the service ensures that it's it's reflected across all the DTNs and it's managed completely, right? So you shouldn't have to do this via configuration files at all. Now the next one I wanted to touch on is policy and data access interfaces. So what does that look like, right? So as you saw in the, um, in the architecture, we have abstracted out the various interfaces. So we have now endpoints, storage gateways and data access, and that gets reflected here. So in V4, there was a single endpoint definition that supported one collection, if you will. And data access was only through grid FTP and all the interfaces were tightly coupled to that, that one construct. With V5, you're gonna have endpoints that support multiple storage systems and collections and have interfaces for configuring uh, those piece, configuring the endpoint through the API. And then data access is via both grid FTP and HTTPS. The slide is also missing a point about the policy is now set on the storage gateways, right? Which domain is allowed to access the data or how often does somebody needs to authenticate? All of that is captured in the storage gateway. Then the next one, this is a net new feature. Um, most of you are probably aware Globus can be used for managing uh, protected or restricted data. We have two additional tiers. One is a high assurance tier, and then another one is a BAA tier if you are managing data that is uh, under HIPAA jurisdiction. So for, for both of those, additional security requirements are put in place on the administrators and the users, um, and also there is uh, audit logging and, and things like that. So GCS v4 just never supported it. GCS v5 does, and that's the flag that you would set at a storage gateway level. So when you have um, a storage system that you know is gonna have higher assurance data, you would then create a new storage gateway, set a flag on the gateway saying this touches higher assurance data and all collections, any data access, any administrative access that happens on that storage gateway and all the collections will have higher security um, policy enforced. And then user authentication. So like I mentioned, we are not using 
certificates anymore. We are moving to using OAuth, so the use of authentication to access the data um, at an institution looks different now. In V4, either we used the uh, CI logon OAuth, my proxy or my proxy OAuth server that institutions installed, and the authentication frequency, as in how often do I have to prove that I have credentials was determined by the lifetime of the certificate, right? And I think the default was 11 days. With GCS5, there is no certificate. We are not authenticating to obtain a certificate. So you, any identity used to log into Globus can be used as the identity for access. We do plan to support custom identities. So if you have your own authentication system that is not used to log into Globus, we'll ship an OIDC server that uh, you can use to uh, hook in that authentication system. And the authentication frequency is determined by the policy on a storage gateway. So as an admin, in place of configuring the lifetime of the certificate in your MyProxy OAuth or MyProxy server, you will set a policy on the storage gateway that says the user has to authenticate every 12 hours or has to authenticate every three days. And then Globus enforces that policy for ensuring the authentication is within that time frame. So just shift where, where we get that policy from and how we enforce that policy. And I think this is the last one, mapping to local account. So as you can imagine, in V4, we were going from a certificate DN, because that is what was being used uh, to authenticate to a local account for, for mapping. And the data access identity was independent of how you logged into Globus. So very concrete example, I log into Globus as rachna at uchicago.edu, and then I authenticate, I access an exceed um, endpoint, a certificate is issued from a, um, a C, from an exceed configured OAuth server, right? So those two identities were independent. There was a certificate and then there was my authentication. And then the certificate was mapped to a local account. We also used EPPN based um, mapping, which means we could get that information from the certificate. Grid maps were still in, are still in use. And then we also supported custom callouts. So you could write um, a custom way of mapping a user to a local account. Now with V5, the policy mapping, again, is as extensible as it was in V4. You can write a custom external program, but the authentication information comes from how you logged into Globus, right? All the authentication context of your, um, the identity that you logged in with, the email, any of the identity provider that was used, the domain, all of that information is made available. And then that gets matched to um, a local account. We provide some uh, matching algorithms to configure by default. And then you can also write a custom program to, to plug into this for matching. Okay. So several things are unchanged. Um, I wanna highlight a few. This is a very small subset. Large, large majority of things are unchanged. First thing, management roles. So you, we still support all the administrator, activity manager, activity monitor roles. So you can have other administrators manage the endpoints and then they also have access to the management console. So you can see all the transfers, the logs, helping the users debug their transfers. Administrators can pause, resume transfers, cancel transfers. All of that is completely unchanged and the policies largely translate as it is, right? You can do this with identities. You can do this against groups. The sharing permission model has also unchanged. So a user creates a guest collection and then they set permission for someone else to read or write data, modulo what the admin has permitted. So the admin still has control over whether sharing is allowed, which from what, what parts of the storage system, who can share, all of that is still there. And from a user perspective, you can grant either read or write access at a folder level to a particular group or to a particular user. And you can also provide the access manager role, which grants someone else the, the right to manage permissions on a share. All of that is unchanged. Um, the server configuration is also largely unchanged. So you, there's a network use parameter in Globus that you can set for how concurrency parallelism and all that is handled. All of that is um, unchanged, right? 
So there's many more. I'm just highlighting highlighting a few. Um, so you'll see that once you once you deploy the uh, GCS5 endpoint, set up a storage gateway, the access from the web app for a user or from an admin managing it, it largely looks the looks same, right? Uh, it doesn't there isn't that much of a um, user experience shift there. So where are we on this, um, on the whole five architecture and how, what the features, right? So particularly 5.4 was released uh, probably about a few months ago here. It's been three months now. And that was the first release where we merged uh, the standard and high assurance support so that you could have a single deployment for uh, with varied storage gateways, some supporting high assurance policies and others not. We support multi-DTN and all of the backup restore pieces. So this is a huge point release for us, uh, which, which brings us pretty close to everything that is needed for um, everything that was in four being included in, in V5, right? So what does a five installation look like? So if you, if you go install 5.4 today, I'm just gonna do a overview of the steps. So the first thing you would do is register the new Globus Connect server um, at developers.globus.org, right? Like I mentioned, this is the way the endpoint itself gets its own credentials. There'll be a client ID and secret um, for, that, for that endpoint. So it's a one-time step that you do. And um, the registration has a project-based management system. So you can add other admins as people who can manage that registration along with you. So there's, there's failover and such there. And then the standard update repositories, install the new GCS packages. And then the next step is to create the endpoint and start the server. So one of the feedback we got from people who have done this before for V4 was a lot of them stopped here and said, why is this not working? Um, in V5, an admin has two additional things. They have to create storage gateways and create a mapped collection before the user can see anything, right? With V5, once you finish this step, all you have is Globus Connect server. So the manager, the grid FTP server, and the Apache server, everything is just running, but there are no logical constructs for accessing the data. So the next thing you would do is create a storage gateway. So the storage gateway is of a particular storage type, and then you would determine policies here, right? Domain, so typically it would be requires identity from at uchicago.edu has to authenticate every 11 days or, or what have you. So it's policies like that. And then you would create a map collection that, that essentially provides the data interface for accessing the data. And once that construct is there, any user with local accounts can now access that mapped collection. And if they're able to successfully log in with the right identity and get mapped to a local account, then they can access their data. So these are all simple command line um, uh, command command line things that you can just run. So this it looks like lots of steps, but it's just two additional um, command line calls. And then we have all the standard configuration pieces, right? You can do endpoint uh, configuration for performance. Um, you could also get your mapped collection to allow guest collection, so allow sharing essentially. So there's a there's a flag that you set to say you want to allow uh, sharing on this one. And you also have options to restrict who's allowed to share, uh, which of your local users are allowed to share, and which parts of the storage system they are allowed to share from. I chose not to walk through this because there's an excellent video that Vass made, um, and it's available on YouTube. I'll share the slides out if Jason can share it out. And there is a nice uh, explanation of the pieces, but also um, a walkthrough and screenshot of all a video of the whole installation. So I highly recommend looking at that uh, if you're installing view 5.4. Okay, so I'm gonna change tack, talk a little bit about um, what else is left and then I'll, I'll open up for questions or if people wanna see a, just a demo of our web app with new uh, V5 endpoints, I can do that as well. So what are the outstanding features for parity? And I have the word parity in quotes here because V5 already far exceeds 
in the features, right? In terms of the number of features that it supports and new functionality. So this really is what else do we need to add to V5 so that somebody who's running V4 can move and they have all the features they had in V4 plus leverage all the new features in V5. So the first one is custom domains and certificates. So like I said, uh, we chose Let's Encrypt as our certificate uh, provider because they have wonderful programmatic interface for us to get certificates. It's worked out really well, um, scales well as well. And we also, by default, um, issue essentially all the endpoints and the collections end up being in a DNS that we manage. So it's like something .data.globus.org is what the endpoints and the collections have, right? I expect it'll be, oh, this will be sufficient for many, many deployments, but as some of the larger institutions and, uh, and others who want to have their own DNS names or their own certificates will uh, need to be supported. So that's what we, have, we are working on right now. And there's gonna be multiple options. So you could choose to do a C name to what we are managing such that we manage the, the, you know, as you add new DTNs, we update the record and it's just a C name, or you could choose to manage the domain completely yourself, right? And just configure it in, in Globus Connect server. Either way, um, the way we bind a particular endpoint to a domain is by looking for the client ID of that endpoint in the text record. So one way or another, the text record must have the client ID that you register, when you register the client ID that was issued for your endpoint. That's how Globus associates that domain name with that, with that endpoint. And then for certificates, it's the same idea. You could choose to drop the certificates and ask Globus to keep it synced across DTNs. The same mechanism we have for syncing across DTNs and backing up using the encryption key so that everything is encrypted, we could use that. Or if you don't wanna do that and you would rather manage the certificates, then you would just make sure that it's in the right place in all the DTNs and we would pick it up from there, right? So what we are trying to do with this is cater to a wide gamut, right? From institutions which are fine running with data.globus.org, they don't want, want to go get their own domain or manage all of that, to institutions who want to manage the domain completely on their own, ensure certificates and keys only in their possession and not backed up at all and put it in the right place. So any of these will get supported and you can pick what you want to do in that space. So that'll be the next piece that, that uh, we are working on will get released. And then the other big nugget that uh, needs to get solved that is also right now in, in early testing is supporting custom authentication. So if you recall, I said, with, with the GCS5, we are using OAuth and OIDC, right? We're not using certificates anymore. So if you are an institution that had your own authentication service and you are running a MyProxy OAuth server in front of it so that when a user accesses your endpoint, they were redirected to your MyProxy OAuth server, they logged in and we got a certificate from there. We need a replacement for that, for that uh, setup, right? So we are shipping an OIDC server and it'll have a PAM module so you can plug in your own authentication. And essentially from a user perspective, it'll look the same. They'll go to your collection. The collection will redirect them to an OIDC server that's running at your institution. They will provide their credentials, whatever is needed. And then the user, when they redirect it back in place of a certificate, we just get an authentication assertion, right? It'll say this is this user at this, this domain. And then that will be used for um, authentication and, and authorization. So the next version, um, next point release, you will see this server that is, that is shipped and can be used in cases where the authentication you need is not already in the Globus uh, login dropdown. And then of course the big one, which is migrating existing uh, V4 deployments to V5, right? So Globus will provide tooling and, and full support for that migration. So once we have the other two features rounded out so that we can have new deployments go to V5 directly, we'll start, work, we'll start um, moving on the migration piece and, and push that out to the community, right? There are lots of other small things, enhancements, uh, fine tuning some of the user experience, 
lots of other small things we're working on, but these are two big features on the on the administra on the uh, Globus Connect server side that needs to get completed. So I'll leave with, we have 15 minutes. Um, I see the questions are racking up, so I'm happy to take questions here. Um, and if we run out, I can spend some time doing a demo, but I'll leave with some of the, the um, documentation. docs.globus.org remains the, the powerhouse here. So that's where you wanna go. It has V4 documents, but also V5. There's an installation guide, and then there is two separate guides that I recommend you review. Um, the identity mapping guide gives you strategies for how to go from the user's logged in identity to a local account and how to write potentially custom mapping. And then the installation walkthrough um, that I mentioned before, we have a link to that as well. And I think that's a 40 minute presentation and that, that actually has all the commands and how to set things up and walks you through the installation itself. Right? So how about we get to questions and then we'll see if we have time for some demo. Okay, well, thank you for, for going through that. Uh... Vass was able to provide additional context on the previous comment about Azure. Uh, another person would like to have a copy of the slides. So make sure if you could share that with me, I'll get that posted for everybody. Uh, Bill would like to know, would it make sense to tie a mapped collection to a PI's research group or some other logical group of people who need to access share the same sets of files? Um, maybe, maybe not. So I think it, it's, it, I, I tend to think about mapped collection at the level of a part of the storage system that you want to restrict. So if, if that's how it map, if, if that's how it works in your case, where you would say, you know, here is this particular part of the storage system that is only accessible to this PI's research group, and you want to create a map collection just for them, and rooted in that location and say, you need credentials from this domain to access it, that might work. Um, so you could use it that way. Typically when people want to support research groups, they tend to create a guest collection and make the PI the access manager on the guest collection. So um, you would pick the folder, you would create a guest collection, give it a name that makes sense for that research group and then make allow the PI to manage access, whether they are granting it to their team using groups or directly, right? So I can see it go both ways, depending on your use case. You could use map collections to isolate it as long as everybody has a local account and the way you wanna manage it is by creating local accounts. If you wanna give the PI the ability to manage all of this on their own, then you could use guest collections to do that as well. I'll also mention you could use a storage gateway. So the storage gateway is really a, uh, is really tied to a particular storage instance, but you could create multiple for the same storage instance if you want to. That will be done if you have very different policies. So for example, if you want this group to authenticate every 12 hours for accessing the data, whereas maybe somebody else who's touching some other part of the file system doesn't have to have that high level of authentication, you could change that. So you could put it there as well. Okay, that answers Bill's question. Uh, and I shared the link to the Google folder and the YouTube channel for people who may not have received the original uh, mail that had that information. We'll make sure we get that uploaded when we complete. Uh, so we'll just put out another call here. If anybody does have questions, please ask them inside of the chat. Uh, we have a little bit of time. So if you do wanna do any demonstrations, I think there's, there's plenty of time to that. Okay, maybe I do share my screen in two and people can ask questions. Um, Jason, this is Vas. Can I just chime in quickly? Uh, Absolutely. One, one thing that um, we're telling folks, and I see a lot of um, familiar names on the on the participant list, so I'm mentioning this for, for those of you that already have version four endpoints but are looking to stand up new ones, um, there's really no need to wait for any future point releases of five. You can use 5.4 right now and you really should be using it. Uh, again, on the assumption that 
you're you already your IDP is already trusted by us through one of the federations that we get that that from. So just want to make that point because some people are sort of waiting until it's all buttoned down and done. But the reality is for the vast majority of folks, especially for the R1s uh, and R2s where the IDPs are there, you can just use it today and should use it today. Yeah. Uh, so if your IDP is listed in this list, you're set. You don't have to wait for the next release. Okay, so I just want to do a quick demo of what it looks like to use a, a 5.4 collection. And I think, I hopefully this, this will show that the user experience is not dramatically different and yet there is like small differences. So, so I'm logging into Globus. This is just standard login. So I bookmarked one of our demo collections. So if I choose one of this, this is a 5.4 collection that's backed by POSIX uh, storage system. If this were a five, five, sorry, if there was a V4 endpoint, they would see a very similar thing. Essentially it says you have to authenticate with a particular identity to access this data. So I logged in with UChicago. The policy on this collection is that you have to authenticate with at globus.org, which is our G Suite domain, right? So I hit continue. I choose globus.org. And this is the, the part that is new in place of sort of seeing a certificate come through to us in the back end. Essentially, the user is consenting, saying they want to allow access to the data on this, on this uh, uh, collection. So once that is done, it should look like a standard Globus, right? pretty small. So it drops in the file system. And then very similar for sharing. So I, let's say this is my folder here. I pick a folder. I hit share on this folder. And then this is touching um, the GCS server to add a guest collection, right? So if you remember in the, in the previous version, you would create a guest collection and then set permissions on top of it. So we've used the exact same model. So I'm going to create it. So test demo. Um, okay. So once I create the collection, then I can add permissions. Find vast here. Just like you would on the before endpoint, nothing has changed here. I can share with a group, all users. You could also do anonymous. Because we support HTTPS now, um, if you set it up as anonymous, then you can actually do an anonymous get on the file and, and access it, right? This comes up, if you use our web app, you have to log in, but that's a client feature. The web app requires you to log in. So if there's anonymous data, it doesn't mean that the server is asking for login, but the client is out having you log in, right? So if you set it to public or anonymous, and if you truly want to test it, you would you would hit it directly from a from a browser. So again, share with all of uh, any of these constructs: user, group, all users, and then you have read or write permission. And then everything looks exactly the same as it would in V4. So I can open this in the file manager. Whoops, my path is not found. Let's go back here and show our transfer itself. Sorry. There we go. And you can move data between V4 and V5 points, obviously, so that's not a problem. So let's go here and start a transfer, right? So all of this looks the same. Um, if I go to my account, I don't know how many of you ever do this, but if you do go look at your consents, what you granted to the various apps, you will start to see more information here. It's more fine grained. You'll start to see the various collections that you have accessed and, and uh, downloaded data from or transferred data from. So that's one of the things that the users may see that is, that is different. Uh, my console, it's not very interesting. I don't have access to admin access on anything, but pretty much it's the same idea. You should still be able to use all the same roles, see tasks, apply POS rules or cancel tasks from here, as long as you have administrative access on the, on the endpoint, right? So, 
not a very exciting demo if you use Globus regularly, but largely the point is the users shouldn't see a big shift in the user experience and it should just look all the same to them, right? Um, Vas, is there anything else you suggest we show? Maybe S3. Uh, no, this is good. I, I'm happy to see some more questions. Yeah. So maybe I'll, does all right, well, I'll, I'll put out one last call. If anybody has any, any last questions, uh, certainly ask them in the chat room. Uh, otherwise, uh, we can put back up the the uh, Globus email addresses so that people know where to where to look and where to where to ask. Uh, let's see. All right, I think we I think we may have exhausted them. So thank you both for, for walking through and showing this. Uh, hopefully uh, this was uh, instructive for people and uh, we can have a smooth transition between the, the instances that are still running four and those that are gonna be moving to five very soon. Great, thanks Jason, thanks for the opportunity. And for those that are still listening, we will have a talk next week with Michael Smithassen and Jay Kraus from LBL. Uh, they're gonna be talking about their experiences of using the Cloudflare reverse proxy service uh, at LBL, which received uh, some recent press because of the outages that they were having earlier, uh, a couple of weeks and months ago. So uh, hopefully people will be able to, to join and we'll make sure that we get this video and these slides posted. Have a good weekend, everybody. Thanks, bye everyone.